Good morning. Once again, my name is Pastor Dave. I'm so happy to be here. Dennis is on vacation. He's uh, not even in the country. So uh, thank you for all coming and thank you for joining us online. I tried to think of a relevant topic and God gave me this one uh, through a very busy and stressful week this last week. Uh, and, and fear of failure, anxiety of perfection. I, I'm kind of a perfectionist a little bit. I was going to come up here and hide behind the podium, but it's not quite big enough, you know. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a pastor, and I, I wish I remember who it was, but he had somebody come up to him after the service, and the, the person said, you know, I've got this person I work with, and she doesn't believe in God. Could you send somebody to uh, come, come uh, witness to her? And uh, the pastor said, no, no, I won't. And she said, well, what do you mean? You won't send, say a prayer for me? So I'm not going to pray for that. So why? He said, he already has. It's you. And sometimes walking out in faith is, is difficult. Um, my, my week was kind of stressful. I had a, a test with Secretary of State, and, you know, my family's been awesome. They've been praying for me and everything else. And I've, if you don't know, I have an eyesight disorder, and I'll go into that a little bit today. But um, I had to go and, and do another road test. And uh, if you don't pass or if you don't... Uh, you know, make the grade, they suspend your license automatically. So um, with my eyesight disorder, I had to go to this test. And I, I knew I'd be fine, but just knowing it's one of those pass-fail things, you know, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up, you know, it's a little bit of a stress. And uh, that's for sure. It's kind of an understatement. But, you know, as I was getting ready for the test, I decided I was going to write this sermon about anxiety the day before the test to have faith, Right? You know, I figure, well, let's put our money where our mouth is. We say we believe in something, we've got to show it. Um, and we've got to show that, uh, that we do believe and that God will get us through. He gave, he gave me, you know, the positions he's given me. He's going to find a way to make sure it works. Um, but there's kind of four things that we can do to kind of help with some anxieties when it comes to life. Whether that be ministering to somebody that you know, or whether that be doing something that's difficult. But we want to do, number one, we want to plan. We want to plan ahead of time. That's pretty obvious. Number two, we want to praise God's name. Throughout the scriptures, uh, David, King David, was a warrior. He worried about a lot of things, and he praised God through the difficulties. He was chased in the wilderness by Saul. He was essentially dethroned by his son and chased and attempted to be killed. He had a lot of things to worry about. He had some valid reasons to worry, but he still he pulled out his harp and he praised God through the difficulties. Part of that, it's, and it's not like uh, the uh, Titanic movie where you see somebody pull out a, uh, a violin and start playing as the ship's going down. No, we're playing because we're on the other side. There is a, uh, a former police officer. He does uh, somewhat political commentary. His name is Brandon Tatum. He likes to do a lot of shirts, and one of the shirts, he's a, he's a Christian, uh, says, in the end, we win. I love that because that's really what it's about. We're praising because there will be victory. Uh, number three, we want to call out to God and communicate what we're worried about. It can be difficult sometimes, but God wants to be there like a father. So we've got to communicate with him. And that doesn't mean every single day getting down on our knees going, I'm worried about this, Lord, and getting up, and then later on in the day, I'm worried about this, Lord. I'm worried about this. We have to have faith that God is going to see it through. So we communicate what our problems are and have faith that he's going to take care of it in his time because it's always in his time. We want it to be when it's in our time, but he knows best. And lastly, that comes to the final thing, that's rest and faith. Because having anxiety and worrying constantly is not going to add one extra day to our lives. It's not going to add one extra moment that we have. So to communicate some of these messages, we're going to look first at Jonah. Uh, well, we're going to first look at Jonah uh, in chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah decides he's going to listen to God, and, and God tells him he needs to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a place in Assyria. Assyria it was a people who were very brutal. They would conquer lands, and they would do terrible things to the people that they would conquer. And number two, two reasons he didn't want to go minister to the Assyrian people, number one, was because he didn't like them. They were essentially his enemy. And number two, I mean, anybody would be afraid of doing that. Thank you. Um, so it says in verses 1-3 that Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh as the Lord commanded, he ran away uh, and he headed for Tarshish. He went and he found a boat 
in Joppa, and he got on that ship, and he went on, well, we have here, he went on a Mediterranean cruise instead of doing what the Lord says. If you're familiar with the story of Jonah, you know that it didn't exactly work out too well for him. At least that part of it didn't work out too well for him. There's a big storm. They realize that it's because God wants Jonah to do something. He's thrown overboard and he's eaten by a fish. So by not obeying God, he did something and it got worse. In Judges 6, we see the story of Gideon. And this is one of my favorites. Um, A lot of people here who know me know my youngest son is named Gideon. It's one of my favorite stories. Because Gideon goes from major wimp to mighty warrior. Now today, the name Gideon means mighty warrior. When we were in the hospital with my son, one of the nurses walks in. She, well, she shuffled in. Um, and she sat down and she looked at the name on the door and she goes, oh, mighty warrior. She knew the story. But in the story of Judges 6, Gideon goes through and, and he's so afraid of the enemy. The Midianites are attacking and they come through and they take stuff from, from the Israelites. And he was so afraid he was threshing wheat in a wine press. So he's basically in a hole in the ground throwing wheat up in the air, hoping the air would separate the wheat from the chaff, but he's in a hole in the ground, so obviously nothing's happening. He's that afraid. And the angel of the Lord comes to him, he says, you're a mighty warrior. He says, no, I'm the weakest person in my family and the weakest tribe. I'm the littlest. And God says, no, you're a mighty warrior, and convinces him to go out and destroy the false idols. And afterwards, his name changes from Gideon to Jerubabel, because he destroyed the altars of Baal. He even further has him go out, because that's not enough. He has Gideon go out into battle, and he takes an army to go defeat the Midianite army, but he doesn't just have them defeat one army versus another. God says, no, we have to show that it's my power, God's power, not human power that's defeating them. So he has them show this by lapping up water. And the people who lapped up water with their hands, he said, okay, keep those people. The people that bent down to the stream and drank like that, he said, okay, send them all home. At the end, he had 300 people versus an army of thousands and thousands. And the 300 defeated the thousands because of God's power, not of Gideon's own. In John, this is this right here is a verse that I love because at my other job, if you know, I'm, I'm also in law enforcement, and uh, there's been an attack on law enforcement recently. It's been difficult, but I put this up at the front desk, this verse, because it's something good to remember. We're set apart. We're different than the world's ways. The world is like shifting sands under our feet, but the Lord is like our rock. We have a reason to be faithful. We have a reason to try to fight that anxiety Do not let your hearts be troubled because you believe in God. It's difficult to do, though, sometimes. It's not easy to look past our current troubles outside of the small picture that we have into God's sight because he sees everything from start to end. In 2 Kings, there's a story of Elisha. A lot of people are pretty familiar with Elijah, who is his teacher, essentially. And Elisha comes afterwards. During that time, the Arameans are attacking. And they're trying to capture the king of Israel. The king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, is uh, planning traps. He sets traps, and every time the Israelites come by, they either avoid the trap or they figure out a way around the ambush. And it gets to the point where it happens so often that Ben-Hadad gets his advisors together because he thinks they have a traitor, they have a mole in their midst. They look at the, uh, the issue and they say, there's, there's no mole, there's no traitor, king. He says, well, how do they know whenever we're going to set a trap? He says, they have this guy, he's a prophet of the Lord. They even recognize God's power. They said, this, this prophet, Elisha, he even knows what you say in your bed. It's kind of spooky, isn't it? It's kind of scary a little bit. But God does know what's in our hearts. He knows what we're thinking, what we're doing, what we're planning. And being right with God is very important. And it is a a constant uh, uh, work to be right with God. So the Arameans, they're 
their plan then was to, instead of trying to capture the king, let's capture Elisha. So they set up the army around the village Elisha is in, and his servant walks out and sees this giant army surrounding his village. Again, terrifying. This is, these are real people, real places. This actually happened. And he runs back in and tells Elisha, what, what do we do? We're being surrounded. You know? And Elisha prays to open his eyes. Open your eyes, O Lord. Open my servant's eyes, O Lord, so that he may see. He says, do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And he opens his eyes, and the servant sees horses and chariots of fire surrounding the other army. That's got to be interesting. Now, we, we see little glimpses of this in, in Scripture, the spiritual world. Now, it's not something we're supposed to be super obsessed with, but, you know, there is a spiritual world out there, and, and God does send help when we need it. And in this particular case, they got a small glimpse into that spiritual help that God had sent them. Elijah went out and he prayed, and they, God blinded the invading army. They led them right into the capital city, and they could have just slaughtered them. Instead, they fed them. It was one of those faith-type moments where they showed the enemy army that this is the real God. This is the power. It's not us. It's, it's God. Which leads me into my first point, and that's to plan. Looking at, at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is planning his third trip to uh, Corinth in Greece. And he has some anxiety as well. Anxiety of a fear of failure. He's been there two other times. There's rumors of sexual sin and immorality that's going around. And he wants to straighten these things up. And, and to Paul, that is worse than anything else, is having that, that fear of uh, a failure. You know? So there's, there's three types of people that he plans on encountering. And number one is the disobedient those that know the rules, know what God wants, and chooses to walk away. Chooses to walk away from God's blessing, and that can cause trouble for the believers. That can cause trouble for everybody else. Uh, number two is the disqualified. Those who don't actually believe. Those who are just trying to go through the motions. Those who just uh, uh, want to be popular or want to do it for a particular reason, look good. And then finally, we have the true believers, the devoted. These are the brothers and sisters, the people that help each other, the people that push each other up in faith, the people that help out the spiritual maturity in everybody else. And that's something that I find interesting, is spiritual maturity. Everybody's kind of at a different level. Everybody is trying to work on understanding things. Sometimes it's difficult when you get somebody who is not quite spiritually mature but has very good questions and that's the uh, essence of apologetics or, or uh, the stating the reasons for one's belief. And we do it with gentleness and respect. In 2 Corinthians 13.4, it says, For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives in God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet the power of God, we are strong. It's not our power, it's by God. And Paul plans, like I said, number one, one way of, of dealing with anxiety is planning ahead of time. If we know we're prepared, we have less reasons to worry, and we need to prepare to have God on our side. Number two is praise. Like I said before, David praised the Lord even when he's being chased by Saul, even when he's being chased by his own son. There's reasons for his difficulties, there's reasons for his anxiety. He had very real reasons to worry. But he took out his harp, he liked playing the harp, and he played. Because he knew God was on his side. He knew eventually God would get him through this in one way or another. And he knew that God was going to support him. And now everybody knows the name of King David. I'd be willing to bet most people you've asked, even that don't read the Bible, would know who King David is in some way. In Israel, they still use the name King David for a lot of things. They have a rocket protection system because they're constantly being attacked in the nation of Israel right now. They have what's called the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome is basically rockets that face up, and the whole job of this Iron Dome is to use radar, and when an enemy rocket comes in, these rockets are about the size of a telephone pole. They come flying in, bless you. 
they come flying in from outside, and the whole idea is the rocket comes down in a city and kills as many people as possible. Well, the Iron Dome detects these incoming missiles by radar, and it shoots another missile at it, and it explodes nearby, which in turn makes the incoming missile explode, and they call it David's Sling. It's supposed to be able to detect either long-range and short-range missiles, and they still are using his name because they know there's power in the Word of God. But in Psalms 57, 1 through 11, King David talks about his faith and what's going to guide him through during this time with Saul. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your <clears throat> excuse me, wings. Until the disaster has passed, I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends help from heaven and saves me, rebu rebuking those who would pursue me. And God sends help to all of us too. But we need to plan, we need to praise, we need to call out for that help. Going back to the, the, uh, the story of Jonah, Jonah runs away, tries to go to Tarshish, gets on a boat, we have a big storm, and he goes on his Mediterranean cruise, it doesn't work out too well. He gets swallowed by the fish, and in the belly of a fish, he calls out to God, God help me, God help me, I messed up. I ran away when I should have been running towards you, I ran away from you because I was afraid. God delivers him. He delivers him from his weakness. He delivers him from all this stuff. And uh, we're not worthy. And, and Jonah was not worthy. And this fish spits him out. And Jonah goes to Nineveh. Nineveh is a huge city. And it takes three days just to walk through it, this ancient city. And I find it interesting, too, that Nineveh, even though it's mentioned in the Bible, for a while there in recent years, some secular scientists didn't think that uh, Nineveh existed. They thought it was, oh, this is just a fairy tale stuff. It's funny how the scripture actually backs up science. And in this particular, or history, in this particular circumstance, for a long time, you know, there's no proof that Nineveh actually existed. There's no proof that the, the Assyrians actually existed. Well, they did. And recently they were doing some excavating. They were doing some archaeology and they uncovered a road in northern Iraq. And as they did more of this unveiling, they found a sign. And in that sign, it was a, a warning. Nineveh that way. It was a warning because these people were dangerous. And it turns out that all the people that said, no, it's just a story, it's just a story. They're wrong. These people were real. And they were scary. And they had this huge city in the middle of their nation. And Jonah went there and he preached what was the probably the most uh, inept sermon ever. Jonah goes and he doesn't even use the word of God in his sermon. He walks around for one day, not three. He walks around for one day and says, repent, destruction is coming in 40 days. That's all he says as he walks around. And to his surprise, they tore their clothes and they repented because they were so distraught. God can use even the, what we think is our weakness for good. He can use what we think is our biggest difficulty to have the biggest impact. And it saved this nation. Even though Jonah was afraid of him, or them, even though Jonah was not the, uh, the most loving of these people, he still used Jonah to save all these people and turn their nation around. You know, when uh, I was diagnosed with a eyesight disorder, it was kind of a, a big surprise. It was a shock. I can't tell you how many times I had called out to God. But every time something was changing, it always happened about a week in, in, in that timeline. Um, so I, was, I wanted to be a police officer. That was my first kind of goal. And first I worked as a sheriff deputy at, at the Open County Sheriff's Office. I worked in the jail. And it didn't look like it was going to happen that they were going to put me on the road. It looked like they were going to separate those two divisions and I'd be kind of stuck where I was at. And it's not really what I wanted. And then one day, the city of Dearborn called me and said, hey, we, we want you to come here. 
And it happened literally in the, in the one week that a contract was signed and I got vested in my retirement, so I was able to take what I had earned with me that one week. Then later on, I had decided I wanted to become a pastor. I had done some research in the scriptures and everything else. I'd started studying. I started going to school. And then I started noticing a difference in my vision. And I went to an eye doctor, and uh, the first eye doctor told me, yeah, you're, you're losing your vision. Um, you have this disease. And he really didn't give me a whole lot of, of information, but they basically said that it would take about a six-month progression, is what they thought. Instead of six months, I got four years. I finished my degree, I had started on my internship, uh, and I had to come forward at my other job and tell them about my vision literally one week after graduating college with my degree in, in Christian ministries. Everything was exactly one week in time where if it happened just slightly before that, things would be a lot different. And it's just one of those things where God saw the right time ahead of time. I didn't see it. I had no idea when this stuff was going to happen. God knew when this stuff was going to happen. But I called out to him and I praised his name. Even in the difficulties, I said, you know, I don't, I don't want this to happen. But afterwards, it made me all the stronger to have to go through all this. Like I said, I, this week I had a Secretary of State test, and it was one of those pass-fail type deals. If I didn't pass it, they were going to suspend my license. And so I forced myself, instead of just sitting around being worried, I decided to write this sermon the day beforehand to show him that, you know, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be, I'm going to be strong because you told me you'll take care of me. It wasn't easy. I had to call out to him. I had to praise his name. I had planned for my Secretary of State test. I went to the area where I knew the Secretary of State was, and I drove around to try to get my lay of the land a little bit. But I did all those things, and you know what? It worked out perfectly for God's glory. That's what it's all about, is we've got to do something for God, and we have to have our walk right with God. Um, you know, like I said, having anxiety doesn't give us any more time. It doesn't make anything better. It just makes it worse. Matthew 6.25 is kind of the, one of the definitive verses on worrying. In 6.25, it talks about being not afraid because God provides food for the birds. He clothes the, the flowers. How much more does God love you? The Bible tells us every single hair on our head is are numbered. God's not going to just let us go. He wants us to have faith. He wants us to rely upon him because it's his strength. God showed his strength when Jesus was resurrected after three days. And similarly, we are weak, but we use God's strength to get us through all these difficulties. So we want to build our house on the rock. Like I said earlier, the world is like sand shifting under our feet. It seems like we have just so many different things happening all at once. Popular culture is moving around. It seems almost by week by week there's something new coming out. God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. That's on purpose. We can rest in that faith. By planning, by calling out to God, by praising, and by resting in faith, because God will be faithful to us. He will be faithful to his word. God is both righteous, he's just, he does not change, and he's gracious. So we can praise his name that he is all of those things all at once. And he gives us that grace to continue to push through and to not be anxious. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. The, the saying of, of God bless America has been around for a while, but I think we need to start saying America bless God because we need to bless his name and thank him for all those things that we do have. We live so well right now. Even with difficulties, we live better than kings used to live back in ancient times. We have air conditioning we have cars, we have, you know, TV, we have our phones. We have so many things that, that weren't around before. And it's easy to see things through that little picture window when we look at the internet and see all the different stories of negativity. 
when we hear the doctors when they give us the bad news. Trust me, I know how that feels. When we hear bad news from family members. But God's going to see us through. It's in his time, not our own. I'd like it to be in my time, but you know, I don't know everything. I don't know what God knows. So he knows better than I do, and I have to just trust and take my hands off the wheel and say, okay, it's in your time. I need to have faith. So if we plan, we call out to God, we praise his name through the difficulties, and then we rest in faith. We can try to tame down some of that anxiety that we might have for the times when we have things to really worry about. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. I'd like to thank everybody who's watching online. I hope everybody has a great week ahead of them and praise God in whatever happens this coming week. Thank you so much.